Good day chaps. So today's video is taking a break from UK vehicles, just so we don't end up too niche, and jumping over the pond to the US to look at a series of vehicles drawn up in the 1950s. These vehicles were drawn up by the Yo Company from the US for a proposed series of tanks. And while none were ever built, they did show some interesting ideas for the time. Many of these vehicles have some serious design flaws, and I initially recorded my findings on these, but then thought, well, where's the fun in that? So we'll let you, the viewer, see if you can spot all the mistakes and problems in the Yo designs, and we've left a few clues in the chat. Let us know your thoughts below. So we'll start with a little bit about the designers of these tanks, the Yo Company. The Yo Company began as Duncan Tools Design Company, formed in 1940, and was founded by Harold L. Yo from Ohio, along with a partner, after graduating from the Wharton School of University of Pennsylvania. Harold Yo brought out his partner in 1946 and renamed the firm to the Edge L. Yo Company. By the mid-50s, the Yo Company had grown to over 500 staff, including designers, draftsmen and engineers. The firm would expand rapidly, and in 1961, they acquired the Day and Zimmerman firm. From here, they designed everything from the Mercury and Gemini space capsules to the design of the futuristic monorail in the 1964 New York World's Fair. Harold Yeo's son, Harold Spike Yeo, would take over the reins in 1976 and the firm would grow massively into a multi-billion dollar business with a huge variety of products in defence related areas and today is run by Harold Yeo III. Our tank story begins in 1951 during the development of the American T-48 project, which itself was to find a way of improving the M-47 pattern. Running parallel to this in the summer of 1951 was a series of studies to consider alternative designs which could be used as a successor to the M-47. The purpose of this project was to look at the more radical or innovative ideas that could be used on the next generation of tanks without being tied to the T-48 project directly thus slowing its development, with ideas from modules and parts to completely new designs. This led to a conference held at the Detroit Arsenal in March of 1952 to review these new designs. The conference, called Operation Question Mark, was the first of several such meetings and was held to encourage interaction between the designers, industry heads and the users and operators of the tanks, which often had conflicting interests and ideas. The first meeting saw seven medium tank concepts, known simply as M1 to M7. None of these ideas would see the light of day. However, it was a good opportunity for the designers and users to swap ideas and see what each was working on or required. With the success of the first question mark conference, Detroit Arsenal then presented a research and development contract in April 1952 to various firms to design and submit concepts and ideas that would feature new solutions to old problems that could be evaluated and possibly be used as the basis for future tanks. Contracts were placed with the HLO Company, the Chrysler Corporation and Associated Engineers Incorporated of Springfield, Massachusetts. Of these, the Chrysler Corporation received two contracts under the Research and Development Program, one for a medium tank with four tracks to allow a very large turret ring and the other a regular medium tank. The other contract with Associated Engineers Incorporated also investigated the concept of a four-track medium tank which resulted in the AE Phase 1 and AE Phase 2 tanks amongst others. The third contract was placed with the Yo firm which in turn would present seven tanks in total and ten modules to aid them. So we'll start with the modules as each of the Yo tanks we will cover had several of these fitted into their plans. Some of these are quite sensible others a little bit bizarre, but each demonstrated some good thinking outside of the box. So starting with number one, the first is a mine flail or roller. This was fitted via a hydraulic lifting apparatus and was designed to be a lightweight system. Each arm extends forwards and had three solid type flails that would rotate when the vehicle was moving, folding back on a hinge on impact before cycling around again. The whole system could be raised or lowered from inside the tank and in theory provide at least some protection against mines. The second module was for a circular magazine built into the breech itself, much like a revolver and not a separate drum magazine. 
The magazine had a selection of rounds for the gun, which the gunner could index the round he wanted, which would then cycle the revolving chamber and feed the round into the breech internally. Once fired, the gas-operated system would channel some of the gas to reopen the firing port and eject the spent casing back into the drum, which would then rotate and a new round could be loaded. The third option was one of the more slightly unorthodox systems, recorded as a walking device to help immobile tanks, and I quote, The walking device is an unconventional method for providing traction in an emergency. Each foot is powered from the same shaft as the main sprockets and may be driven independently in either direction. The device is engaged from within the tank when track damage occurs. The fourth idea looks promising but also has some issues. The idea was for a track within the track system. The designers felt that in most cases of striking a mine, the track would break and the vehicle become immobile. They conceived an idea that an inner track running under the primary track covering the sprocket and last three road wheels would then be able to carry the vehicle off in an emergency, a bit like short tracking. The fifth idea involved a new gun shield system. This was a hybrid of the old gun mantlet on tanks and the internal gun mantlet, with the mantlet still being exposed but now located behind the gun's trunnions, which the designers felt would offer a better balanced gun, while the shape and large spaced armour section would improve protection and lower the weight. Overall, it's not a bad idea for its time. The sixth idea involved the position of an auxiliary machine gun on the turret side, in a bull mount. The O team felt that in this position, after studying various layouts, it was the optimal placing for an extra gun to cover the left side. The gun is hinged in a way internally to fold against the turret wall when not in use. The seventh idea is actually for its time not too bad. It's an armoured ready rack for the ammunition, with emergency venting should rounds detonate. The reasoning was that internal fires are the biggest threats to a tank, with ammunition cooking off. This places the ammunition in a protected chamber from spool. The rounds of munition types could be cycled through by the loader via a switch, and in the case of a fire, the expanding gas would eject out through the quickest way possible, which was a vented funnel to the top of the turret. The eighth concept was a bustle-based autoloader, with 18 rounds of 105mm ammunition in a mechanical belt-driven system. The commander would select a round, which would then be conveyed to the lineup with a breech, and a rammer would feed the round into the gun and would extract the case again after firing and eject the round out of the back of the tank. The ninth idea was for an ammunition grabbing system, which would be placed on the turret roof, and a pulley system that could be drawn out and used by the loader. He would pull down on the cable, attach a clamp to the round, and then it would retract, lifting the round up to the ready racks. The tenth and last idea was for hydraulic shock absorbers or pneumatic suspension for what they call a Christie type suspension. This one is a little bit confusing as while the ideas for hydraulic shock absorbers are pretty good, the image is not that of Christie type suspension, which by this point had been faded out and appeared to be a torsion type. However, several US publications use the word Christie for multiple suspension types, albeit incorrectly, so we'll cut them some slack here. So with that said, let's look at the tanks themselves. These were presented on the 1st of June 1953 to the US Army Ordnance Corps as part of the Detroit Arsenal in Michigan. There were seven medium gun tanks, weighing between 43 and 47 tons. All feature well-sloped cast armour, powerful engines and a 105mm gun. Harold Yeo wrote as a cover, Our specific concern was preliminary concept studies leading to the design of a new medium tank. This entailed the evaluation of existing ordnance components, as well as the development of new components and tank concepts. Studies were made of the design problems of the past, weighed against the background of performance. From this material, we endeavoured to assemble a new medium tank within the framework of the required military characteristics. Through the programme, the moving force behind our research engineers was the desire to contribute in a tangible manner to the security of our country. Each tank was given a letter, number, letter format. So we'll begin with the first, M for medium, 1 for the number, and Y for yo. M1Y was described as a medium tank proposal of conventional design, but with special features. The four-man tank features well-sloped cast armour on both the hull and turret, with a weight of 46 tonnes. The main armament was to be, like the rest, the T140 
105mm gun, as was fitted to the T95 E3 tank concept. The gun had a turret ring of 89 inches and had 49 rounds available. The gun depression was recorded as minus 10 and an elevation of plus 20. Secondary protection came in the form of a 12.7mm machine gun in the US fashion of the time with a blister cupola on top of the tank, a coaxial machine gun as well as covering fire to the left side of the turret. The commander sat on the right hand side with the gun in front of him, driver forwards and centre and the load on the left hand side. The armour is only recorded as 5 inches at 60 degrees for 254mm of protection over the frontal glassy plate, evenly spread. Power was provided by an AOSI 1195-5 engine, as were all the tanks in this list. This engine was the go-to plant, and appears like the gun to have been a set specification. This would have given 675 gross horsepower, and coupled with an XT500-1 gearbox for 14.7 horsepower per tonne. None of the vehicles had a speed allocated, but the range was given as 100 miles. The Yo company stated the tank would have adequate driver's visibility, good climbing ability, and improved Christie type suspension, a well balanced gun, and good obliquity from incoming fire in all directions. The next vehicle, the medium tank number two, was again a four man tank. It had a commander, gunner, loader, and driver. However, where this tank differs from the normal was the crew positioning. The commander was in the turret, but in a rear central slot like some American tanks at the time. The loader to the turret's centre left to load the T140 105mm gun. The driver was in the front left side of the hull and the gunner was in the front right side of the hull. The armour remains the 5 inches of well sloped steel. There was no mention of any electrical or hydraulic control system for the gunner. The reasoning behind this crew placement was that it increased the maximum amount of ready rounds available to the loader to 33 rounds out of the 45 carried. The Yo team felt that such an arrangement would lower the turret height and width to create a smaller frontal profile. The vehicle had 10 degrees of gun depression and 20 degrees of elevation. With that said, let's move on to the next vehicle, the Yo 3. The third tank is actually not too bad. They designed a vehicle with a minimum turret frontal area and great ballistic superiority, and more importantly, did it without putting the gunner in the hull, or inside the gearbox, or some equally useless placement. The basics are standard fare now, a T140 105mm gun, 5 inches of armour, AOSI engine, and the same gearbox, with a weight of 45 tonnes. A four-man crew, the commanders located centre and back of the turret, with a 50 cal in the US blister cupola, the gunner in front and the load to his side with 48 rounds carried, with 26 rounds ready to go. The rest are located either side of the driver. The turret and hull have good all-round ballistic shapes with a well-cast and rounded front hull and limited turret frontal area. The next vehicle is the Yo 4. This time they went back to being unusual. We have an oscillating turret inside an armoured ring housing. Thus we have a turret of two parts, top and bottom, behind a large boom shield to the front, which is a rather odd way of doing things. We have a four-man tank with the crew at least in the right places. The same 105mm gun, an engine and so forth. The gun's depression is recorded as minus 10 and plus 20. The weapon is not a fixed mount like many oscillating turrets, able to pivot on both trunnions and pivot point. The shield appears to offer 4 to 5 inches of armour then an air gap, then about one inch of steel for the turret, while the front arm is five inches. The boom shield does not raise or lower like the oscillating turret does. The fifth medium yo tank has a small oscillating turret on top with a very narrow profile to the front, coupled with 10 degrees of gun depression and 20 degrees of elevation on the 105mm gun. The engine and gearbox remain the same. The commander and gunner are in the rear of the turret while the loader is located in the hull facing aft. Ammunition is fed up the turret ring neck into the turret and then placed into the breech by means unknown. The driver is mounted forwards and centre with a large hatch above him. To his left and right and behind the loader are located two of the Yo machine guns facing either side of the tank. The tank has well sloped armour that tilts in towards the turret face 
and also towards the turret ring. Spent shell cases appear to be ejected via the hatch below the gunner's feet. The four-man tank has five machine guns. The O team believe that this vehicle, with its narrow profile and weight of 40 tonnes, would have a decent ground pressure of 9 pounds per square inch. The neck tank is a similar vehicle, the Yo 6. This too has an oscillating turret with a 63 inch turret ring, 105mm gun and the usual engine and transmission setup. Unlike the tank before it, the loader, gunner and commander are compressed into the turret, while a semi-automatic loading system appears to load the rounds from the hull below. However, the commander is to the right and the gunner sits up behind the loader. Due to the shape of the turret, the loader is in a sitting position. The turret ring is wider and the rounds are fed up to the main gun on a dual layout system left and right of the gun, with the rounds emerging either side of the breech. The armour is well sloped both up and down, offering a high chance to ricochet conventional rounds. The vehicle had a stereoscopic rangefinder. The drawings, plans and models are a little odd for this vehicle as all differ slightly. And now for the last vehicle in this list, the medium tank Yo No. 7. This vehicle really is quite peculiar. It was a proposal for a medium tank that had the engine in the turret bustle, while the rest of the transmission was in the hull. So the vehicle is what you can expect from the Yo tanks at this point, 105 gun, 5 inches of armour, and a weight of 43 tonnes. The same engines and the special gearbox. Where this vehicle differs is in the engine placement, which is in a large high turret that extends far back over the deck vents on the rear. By placing the engine in the turret they felt they could shorten the hull and shorten the ground length. To make this work the AOSI 1195-5 engine in the turret bustle transmits the power through a ring gear that runs around the turret ring and connects up with a gearbox to provide power to the rear mounted drive sprockets. 11 ready rounds are kept in the cramped turret with the rest of the 49 rounds kept to the driver's left who himself is situated to the front right hand side of the tank. The gunner has a stereoscopic rangefinder. Inside the turret bustle is a very large fuel tank located behind some thin armour plate. The Yo team felt that by doing it this way they could overcome the balance issue of US tanks as the engine section would counterbalance the gun. So to the conclusion. The O tanks were an interesting selection of ideas on how to overcome some problems in tank design of the period and offer an interesting insight into the ideas and theories floating around. None were ever used or went further in this project, although several more question mark conferences would arise with equally interesting ideas and theories including nuclear powered tanks and so on. Well guys, that's the end of this one. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Did you spot all the flaws and mistakes? It's quite an extensive list. Give us your views below. If you did like this video, give us a like and subscribe to help the channel grow or give it a share. And until next time, toodle pip.